Okay, Boker Tov. Boker Tov. Nice to see all of you that I can see, or your names or telephone numbers if I can't see your face. And happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Just give me one moment. Okay, so welcome. Welcome to part two of our discussion on the Shaba Onish, reward and punishment. Last week's discussion was based on the opening uh, Pasuk verse of the Parsha. Yeshiv Yaakov, Be'eretz Mugure Aviv, Be'eretz Kena'an, that Jacob dwelt in the land of the sojournings of his father, in the land of Kena'an. And, and from there, we went to the Rashi, who cites a Medrash. And the Medrash that Rashi cited tells us that B'kesh Yaakov Leishev B'Shalva, that the word for dwelling, of uh, lay shaved, like we say, make that bracha in the sukkah, lay shaved basuka, to, you know, uh, people sometimes translate it as to sit, because there's a, a related word, is to sit, yeshiva, like, I guess, you know, if you're studying Torah in a yeshiva, you know, you're sitting a lot of times around the tables and discussing, or listening to a shia, but it, but but the proper word I say in, in in the sukkah of leshev is to dwell, and in, and in fact, you know the, there are authorities who, who hold that even if you wouldn't eat in the sukkah, that you're just going in the sukkah to sit down and relax, or to walk back and forth, or even to make a telephone call, that you would still make the the bracha of Leishev Basuka, because that's part of dwelling. You know, and, and we use our condos, our homes, you know, to, uh, to read a book, to read a newspaper, you know, to talk to people, either face to face or by phone, etc. So all this would be part of dwelling. And here the dwelling seems to have this added connotation, according to the Medrash, is that just like we want to be at peace in our homes, and just as the sukkah, maybe, you know, it's related really that the sukkah is a symbol of shalom, of peace. So that's what Yaakov wanted. Yaakov wanted peace. Not just that he wanted it, that it was his understanding that that's what it, that it would be. But okay, that's more than Rashi. That's already from part of Rav Salavechik that we make, mentioned last week. But, but so Yaakov was hoping for a quiet life in the land of, of Canaan, unlike what he had suffered for so many years before. But the Medrash says that, that God wasn't going to give it to him, that the fury of the episode with Yosef pounced onto the scene. And while Tzadikim Mivachim Leishei B'Shalva, while righteous people often are desirous to live a peaceful, calm life, that Hashem's response to them is what? It's not enough that I already have this beautiful portion for you in Olam Haba and in, in the world to come, you know, in Gan Eden, that's an eternal existence. I got this special place for you that's not good enough for you. You, you need to have stuff down here in this uh, physical, materialistic world. And with the implication be that God has the better answer to it. So that's the Medrash that Rashi cited. And then from Rashi, we moved on to the Ksav uh, uh, to the uh, Sofer, who says that Yaakov and Esav had different portions waiting for them. 
that Yaakov's portion ultimately, his, his real reward would be this eternal existence in a very high level of Olam Haba, the world to come. And that Esav instead would have his portion of being happy in this world. But essentially the Sav Sofer says that if you're always happy and always at peace in this world, that might compromise your portion in the world to come. So that in order to protect Yaakov's claim, or, pro, or in, intended reward consequence in the Olam Haba in the world to come, so he had to experience some types of discomfort in this world, because without discomfort in this world, then it would be like he had uh, you know, everything in this world and next world. And that's usually not, not the case. So what we saw from this Sav Sofer, based on the Medrash, is that it's not that Yaakov did anything wrong that troubles befell him, that it actually was in his long-term interest to have some trouble. I mean, it was significant, you know, to have some trouble in in this world in, in order that the, the greatest reward possible would be preserved for him. When we spoke about Rav Salavechik, it was a very different approach. Again, what we just said right now is that it's not that Yaakov necessarily did anything wrong. It just was in his, his interest to, to have some discomfort. And actually this is uh, echoes a, a Gemara, a section of Gemara right near the beginning of Talmud. The Talmud, the, the Gemara part of, of, of Talmud, you have the Mishnah and you have the, the, the Gemara. So already on Daf He, the fifth page, and there's no page one. So you have, you have pages two, three, four, and five. You know, double-sided. You know, it's A and B. But on, on, on Daf He, Amud Aleph, 5A, the Gemara tells us as follows. Amar Rava. Rava said, others say it wasn't Rava, it was Rav Chista. That if a person sees that he is uh, experiencing discomforts, the Hebrew word for that in this context is yisurin. That could be all, any, any kind of, it could be physical, emotional, mental, financial. But if a person is experiencing Yisurin, so he should, he should examine his activities very carefully. In other words, the basic thought here, at, at least at the beginning of this teaching, the basic thought is that if you're a, you know, Jewishly a good person, or in God's book, you know, whatever, you know, for a Jew, it means Jewishly, for a non-Jew, it means not, you know, non-Jewishly. Whatever it is the expectations that if we're doing the right thing, so, you know, then we shouldn't experience these yisurim, these uh, discomforts. So the Lord says, that if you do have these discomforts, you know, check yourself out, you know, review, review your activities to see if you need to improve something. And if you can't find in your review, you can't find anything that you've been doing wrong, either by commission or omission, then the likely answer is that one is guilty of the uh, omission, you know, the Beatle Torah of, uh, of letting opportunities to study Torah go by unseized. And 
if you consider that fact and still feel, well, that's not true. You know, I spend whatever the formula would be, the right formula, but I'm always learning Torah. I have to do other things in life. That's, that's understood. But I have regular schedules for studying Torah, so it can't be that either. So in other words, after this careful review and going into the default uh, a pr prime uh, offense, still a person finds nothing wrong. The Gemara says, you know, Rava or, or Avchista, as the case may be, says, then you should know that you are having Yisurin Shel Ahava, that these discomforts are coming not because of any displeasure that Hashem has with you, but just the opposite, that it's because God cares about your long-term welfare. I'm not defining long-term, but the impression would be mostly olam haba. There could be more than that. But God, that God says that I'm going to do this person a favor by having him have discomfort. So that's a tricky thing. You never know. So these people have things that are not going their right way. You never know is it that I did something wrong or it's because God loves me. Um, and we got to try our hardest to try to figure it out. So we make sure we're on the right path. But that would be the approach that seems that the that the medrash that Rashi cites and certainly with the explanation of the Ksav Sofer, that, that it's not that Yaakov did anything wrong but that God in, in protecting Yaakov's share for the world to come took certain actions that made life uh, uncomfortable, painful for, for Yaakov. When we looked at Rosalevechik last week, it, 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 there was a very, the possibility became just the opposite. We talked about the, the, the fact that Yaakov was not able to have that peace in this world really because of, I would say really two decisions. I didn't identify two decisions last week. I really think I only spoke about one, but when Yaakov stood in front of his father who couldn't see and claimed, Anochi Esa Vichorecha, I am Yitzhak, your firstborn, which was not true, that that started that floodgate of problems for Yaakov. He had to flee Esav's wrath. He had to deal with the deceptive uh, Lavan. And in the end, because of Lavan's deceptiveness, Yaakov wound up marrying two wives when he was only supposed to marry one and Rachel. Instead, Leah was substituted. And when Yaakov protested, Lavan agreed that he could also marry Rachel. But because of that, eventually he has children from each of those wives. And it's the children of those wives that have some type of rivalry or tension. I mean, maybe not with Benjamin per se, but certainly through Yosef, uh, you know, Benjamin came several years after. But certainly, anybody who has background noise, if you can uh, mute yourself, if you have background noise. Okay. Ah, okay. I'm going to thank uh, one of the support people actually muted everybody right now. But when you do have a question or a comment, you're welcome to unmute yourselves. So you know, so so you, so Yaakov wound up having children who had some type of tension between them, mostly because Yaakov made a decision to, at least on the surface, actually not all agree, um, but the but what what the action really was. But the Torah does testify that the brothers were under the impression that Yaakov loved Yosef more than uh, any of the others. And that uh, put them at odds with Yosef, which was only exasperated by the dreams that Yosef had and by other actions that he was taking that were not so favorable in the brother's eyes. So according, 
you know, to, to that analysis, uh, it, you know, we can't necessarily say that Yaakov, as is true for any human being, that Yaakov was free from mistakes. And mistakes that uh, involve that certainly, certainly the, uh, you know, the, the deception to Yitzhak, black and white, uh, you know, in general, we're not allowed to do that. And uh, and we and we learn from that, you know. Chazal, our sages, tell us, you know, you know, learn from Yaakov not to play favorites with your children. So it's certainly good advice to emanate from those from those two areas. So that that was the the, the second view that uh, you know with it, that we took out in terms of Rashi. And what I'd like to do with you today, as I believe I shared with you last week, was to look at the commentary of the of the Malbim on on this uh, on a section from from Torah so let me read if you have a Chumash the section that uh, I would um, like to uh, read from with you comes from Sefer Devarim, the fifth book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, chapter seven, starting with verse nine. The three three psukim that I want to take a, a look at together with you, and they read as follows. Moshe is talking to Bnei Yisrael, and he says to them, You should know that God, your God, is the God in the world. He is the, the trustworthy, the reliable God. He protects and honors the covenant and the kindness. Laohavav to those who love Hashem. Ule Shomre Mitzvotav to to those who adhere to his commandments. Actually, there may be like two categories being referred to here. One would be maybe people who love Hashem, the others who are afraid to mess up. So that's what motivates their observance. And, but, but, I sh but in uh, either case, there's a long-term commitment to observe covenant uh, and chesed you know, e for a thousand generations. Here it's in the, in the plural. We may come to uh, uh, discuss uh, a little variation of it, but it's hard to, to uh, translate it into English. In Hebrew, it's written that elef dor, th a thousand generations. You know, they're both in the singular. In English, it would be hard to translate like that. And then continues Moshe. Umishalem lisonav el panav. That he, meaning Hashem, pays it, meaning you know, delivers consequences to those who hate Hashem. How do you hate them? We didn't define how you love Hashem, but, but you know, basically you love Hashem by performing mitzvahs, how you perform the mitzvahs. Uh, Rashi brings down, uh, also in Sefer Devarim, that loving God is, the way you love God is that you generate others to have positive feelings to Hashem, that you should be the source of others coming to know and love Hashem. So those who, those people who love, and and Sonav, his 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 enemies, or uh, or those who hate Hashem, you know, it's people who act against what Hashem expects of us, that th they will get their payment. I'll use the word payment here. Payment is, I don't know. Usually we think of payment in a positive way. It's, it's not the only thing, but but here it would be. I think we want to understand it as positive. You'll see why momentarily. So Hashem will pay, uh, will make a payment 
to those who uh, hate Hashem, don't follow the way of Hashem, El Panav, right to their face. And the next word within the same phrase, you know, in he in the in the trup in the text, we have what's called a, an etnachta. It's like a, an upside down wa, wide Y, or or a, or an, or a, a C turned with the open part down and a, and a little uh, cap to it. A, a, a line cap is an etnachta. That's like a that's a, a comma. So within that first part of the of the verse the last word is to cause him to be lost hashem's going to give some kind of payment literally to the face meaning in his lifetime to those who hate hashem going to get a payment but the payment's going to be meant to cause them to be lost Lo ye'acher l'sono. Hashem's not going to delay to those who hate him, the one who hates him. But rather, el panav yishalim lo to his face in his life, uh, to his in his lifetime he will pay them. Right. The, the uh, third pasuk uh, we're not going to do right now. So, so I, I want to, uh, I mean, how understandable are those two verses that I just read? Can, can you show me with your, with your hands? If they're very understandable, give me five fingers. Um, if they're not understandable, you can give me, you know, a, a zero, or you can give me anything in between. How understandable are those verses to you? Come on, let me see. Not too hard. It's good exercises, just in case you haven't had any exercise today. You know, no, no double voting. You know, that's a big thing in the news today, a little bit, no double voting, just vote once. But uh, let me, with, with your fingers, let me just see. I have to uh, 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 change my, my view a little bit. Come on, can I see that again? I only see two people voting, what's going on? Plus we see a lot of people not sharing their picture. All right. Okay, I don't think anybody voted five, at least not that I can see. So let's try to, cl let's try to clarify that situation with the words of the Malbim. So the Malbim says that when it comes to understanding God's reaction, God's payments to, you know, to the righteous and punishment to the wicked, those are words that, that the Malbim's using in his commentary, that at first glance, it looks like there is a, a terrible mistake made at times. Because sometimes we see righteous people who are suffering and wicked people who are prospering. Teda, you should know, says the Malbim, that Hashem Elokecha and this is the, the language that, that Moshe is using, you know, a double reference to, to Hashem. This is Hashem and Elokecha, coming from Elohim. That, that, that Hashem, and the use of the name Elohim here is emphasizing that that's a mode of Hashkacha, like Hashkacha Pratis, we talk about in, in, in a, a crisper Hebrew, Hashkacha Pratit. In the uh, Ashkenazic uh, Yiddish uh, uh, expression, be Hashkocha Pratis, which means in individual providence, that Hashem pays attention to each and every individual. I mean, not to the same degree. Some of us deserve it either in a plus way or a minus way more than than others. But. You should know that these, these aren't necessarily haphazard events that are occurring because God does look out and over people and, and part of Hashkacha Pratis of this divine providence is the delivering of reward and punishment. Goes on the Malbim to say 
that human beings, when they feel that they owe somebody something, they owe somebody a reward, and even though it would be usually against the Torah to uh, deliver you know, a punishment at the hands of human beings, unless they were appointed as the, the judges and go through a judicial process, but that the, that the tendency for human beings, and I'm not talking about court systems now per se, you know, if they're backlogs, but you know, people in, in their own mind, how they wanna handle a situation that they see themselves usually that they need to react quickly. It, you know, whether it's giving somebody a gift for something nice that they've done for them or, or giving them agita, some type of grief for the aggravation that they've caused them. And again, it's not really, that's not allowed by Torah law you know, to, to take revenge, but, 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 but revenge is uh, an innate uh, emotion that that we uh, that we feel that at times the Torah is reg is is guiding us that we have to regulate that and, and overcome that we have to look for acceptable ways of ex of expressing ourselves starting off by letting the person know that we're upset with them but but it, but the mob is speaking what the human tendency is we have you know a lot of people in the world feel that if I have an urge to do something, it must be right. And I have to act on that urge. I'm not gonna fight my urge, you know. I'm being told that this is what I should be doing. Well, that's not necessarily true. You know, animals act on instinct, but, you know, and even animals could be tr trained to some degree. So we may feel certain instincts but at the same time, the Torah gives us guidelines of how we're supposed to be the, the gibor, the uh, warrior who's able to conquer his inclinations and bring them in line with the Torah regulations. But, but that tendency is for the person who's not trained to have self-control in these areas. So the tendency is to uh, you know, deliver the consequence soon why it's not only because of the urge says the album but it's because we don't know if we'll have the ability to do it later on you know one way or the other i want to give somebody a really nice gift but who knows if the stock market doesn't do well maybe i can't give the gift that i want to give to that person or on the other hand i want to take revenge on somebody if i wait too long maybe i'll be too weak or don't have the resources needed to take the revenge again not not a Torah way to do, but we're talking about just what people are feeling. So, so that the Malbim says that the, the tendency for human beings wanting to see consequences be immediate is coming out of their own recognition that they can't guarantee what their ability would be to carry out their intentions in, in the long term. But of course, that's not a problem for Hashem. Hashem's abilities you know, never change. So anything Hashem wants to do, Hashem can make sure it happens. Whether it happens today, 20 years from now, it, 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 you know, it, it doesn't matter. Hashem always has the ability to carry out what he wants to do. I guess the only thing that would change that, and God would be happy about it, is that if somebody had transgressed, uh, Hashem is happy for that person to tshuva, and then in which case he changes the, the ledger of, of what's owed to him. So building on that thought, the, the Malbim teaches that delaying, you know, we see in, in the psukim that we studied that when it, it said that God will, uh, uh, you know, you know will, will protect and honor the covenant and the kindness, the chesed, which the Mabin says chesed is a, is a code word for reward in this world. And God, could, for, for those who love Hashem or follow Hashem's ways, it, it, it's good for a thousand generations. Now, I'm not sure. How does that help me, actually? 
how does it help any one of us it, uh, as an individual if I tell you, don't worry, whether it's today or 200 years from now, don't worry, you know, God's going to pay us, you know, I, you know, how do we feel about that? Then, but then for the, for the righteous person, for the, uh, for the uh, enemies of Hashem, so we're told that God's going to pay them to their face and will not delay. So the, so, so the Malbim says, you know, sometimes what we find is that the righteous people have a, 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 a delay in getting what we would think should be their reward for being righteous and, and or they find solace in the world in their lifetime. And, and the, and the mob says though, that we really should try to set the record straight that there's no guarantee. And the Rappin doesn't quite quote the Gemara here, but the Gemara in Kedushin says, uh, reward for doing mitzvahs in this world doesn't exist. That's not, that's not the, the contract that it has to be that way. I mean, the Mabam himself actually uh, in a variation of words of the Rambam, the Rambam says that the only real reward that's sort of guaranteed in this world is reward that comes from performing mitzvot ben adam lechavero, the interpersonal mitzvahs, which the, which the Rambam and subsequently the Malbim say sort of have their own built in rewards because the more goodness that we perform in society, the more we influ influence society. So the more we give that's good, the chances are we're, we're going to get it back. So it's sort of like a, an automatic, you know, built in. So that could be maybe, you know, sort of natural, but to get other types of rewards is not really part of, of nature, you know, in, in this world. And, but it is granted at times, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, you know, we could have comfort in this world too. But, but we want to be careful because what the Malcolm points out is that the real reward of performing mitzvahs in this world is the impact that those actions or inaction by holding back, like not taking revenge, not speaking Lashon Hara, that the actions that we take that conform to the guidelines of Torah in this world actually raise our soul to a higher level. And therefore, when it comes time for the real reward, which is in Olam Haba, only after our journey in this world, we will have promoted ourselves to a higher level. So that the real reward ultimately, you know, we, we don't have so many descri descriptions you know, of it other than we're basking in the presence of the Shekhinah of the divine glory and certainly no you know, material or physical rewards that are promised, but ultimately that's the real reward. You know, hopefully we'll have a, an acceptable degree of comfort and most of our life be trouble free, but the real reward is later on in the midst that we do uh, refine our, our soul and that sort of becomes, you know, gets our soul gets you know, put into the uh, disc reader and, uh, and our score comes out. Well, when, when we're born, as we say in the early part of the Siddur, we say, God, the soul that you placed within me is pure. We're given a pure soul. When it comes time to return the soul to God, it must be pure. Hopefully, it's even more pure, that it's more developed. We come into the world with a clean slate, which has holiness to it. Uh, our, our requirement is to return it no less pure, so that if we have damaged our soul by transgression, that has to be addressed. We're better off addressing it in this world than in the world to come. And uh, hopefully, for all of the mitzvahs that we observed, we actually have 
enhanced the holiness of the soul over what it was when it was originally given to us by Hashem in our creation and, and in, our, in, in our birth. The Mabba makes another, I would say, dramatic statement. The Mabba says that there are times that God holds back reward for the righteous because it would be better off if Hashem paid it to descendants rather than to the people who actually performed the righteous acts. Now, again, this delay uh, doesn't have any negative effect on what's waiting for a righteous person in the world to come. And also righteous, some of you may recall, it's my typical uh, pre Neila talk, is that to technically to be a righteous person, all you need is the point value of, of a one credit more than any demerit we have for where we've fallen short in observance of, of mitzvahs. So, you know, if your score, your, if your weighted score, you know, turns out to be, uh, you know, a thousand and one merits uh, versus 1,000 demerits, technically we're righteous, but we have to clear up those 1,000 demerits or else we're going to wind up, you know, paying for them with different types of uh, discomforts possibly. So there are different levels of tzaddikim, of righteous people. The minimum is to squeak it through and then it get, gets all the way up. But so the, these, the, the righteous people that we're talking about that the Malvin really is referring to uh, in, in the context, you know, really would be the Avot and the Imahot, that there, that there was a, a, a postponement of paying the reward and it was paid to their heirs. And the Malvin says that Hash, had Hashem not uh, done that, that we would still be strangers in our own land as we would not be in control of Eretz Yisrael of the land of Israel. It's another interesting view. You know, there are uh, many in, re in religious circles that uh, have difficulty recognizing the halakhic legitimacy of the state of Israel. And that uh, is uh, based on, on one of two major uh, objections. One is that they're under the uh, impression that autonomy, Jewish autonomy in the land of Israel can only be restored under the leadership of a Mashiach, who Mashiach, technically speaking, is a king of Israel. Kings of Israel were anointed. That's the the Mashiach comes from the word meaning to to uh, to anoint. And so we would have a human being who will live a lifespan and also die. But but uh, since we have no king of Israel now, so the the next king of Israel would also be the, the Mashiach, and you'd have to wait for that to uh, to re regain. Jewish autonomy in our land. There are many arguments against that viewpoint, but you know, that viewpoint is is held and in its extreme format by you know the, the most extreme on what we call on the religious uh, spectrum. But it but it goes close to the center as well. You know, with some. And the other objection is that the state of Israel was founded by non-religious people sometimes anti-religious people. So where's the Kedusha? Where's the holiness? So there are two answers to that. One, the Malvin just gave us. But then none of us should think that we're so great that in our merit, we uh, have been the recipients 
of God's blessing of having Jewish autonomy in, in the great modern state of Israel. Not, there's plenty still to develop, but it's, a, it's an amazing place. But that for the Mahabam says that, in, that, that we're there because the Avot, the Imahot, had great merits which weren't paid. That's Hashem kept them in the bank and it's paid, it's paid the recent generations the reward that really should have gone to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So that delay, you know, had, you know, benefited others and benefited Kla Yisrael, the, the nation of Israel. The second answer, by the way, to those who uh, question the legitimacy of, of Eretz Yisrael is a point that Rav Salavechik made, is that, you know, when a person, uh, say he's a, a farmer, and he has to tithe his animals. And he has them walking through a narrow gateway and he counts them and then marks the 10th one to know that that particular animal was the 10th. Or so Avechik noted, you know what? You know, that 10th animal, which now has a, a degree of holiness to it, you can't have the 10th holy without the nine secular. And this uh, applies, you know, in the state of Israel. It's true. You know, many of the people, not all, but many of the people, I mean, there were a lot, a lot of, you know, there were significant religious leaders who promote, promoted Aliyah during some very hard times and way before the establishment of the state of Israel. Uh, but even at the time of the state of Israel, there were, you know, religious people involved in the development of the state of Israel, but there were many who weren't. But, all right, so everybody had played a role, Baruch Hashem. Different people played played roles, and in the end, we, we, we have something that has a, a degree of holiness to it, special with specialness and, and, a, and a blessing from Hashem that we have to recognize. So, so from the from the from the Malbim, you know, we see that sometimes, you know, not getting a a, a reward can can be you know uh, extremely beneficial. And the final point in, in the, in the Malbum is to take a, a careful look at those people who were called Sonav, those who are enemies of Hashem, uh, maybe even hate Hashem, don't perform the, the mitzvahs uh, of, of, of Hashem. You know, why is it that they should get reward in, in this world? Why, why do they get, you know, uh, the, Paid El Panav to his face in this world, where we, where we have our, our physical bodies. Why does he get it? Why is it Lo Yacher that it's not delayed? That a, that a righteous person could have delays, maybe even a permanent delay in this world, at least for themselves, you know, or a delay and it's given to their generations, or it's you know another delay which we'll see momentarily. But, so why is it that the evil person, the wicked person, the one who's not so, you know, different degrees in being uh, wicked, you know, also, to, it's a, a spectrum. So the Malbim says, he has, really has like three main points. He says that sometimes, that the first point, you know, may apply to a very small number of people especially in this day and age, but it's the Paro model, is that why did God harden Paro's heart? You know, we'd have to, I, we can't do it right now, but we'd, we'll have a chance in a few weeks, not, not the Paro from this week's Pasha, you know, we'll talk about the Paro in, in Pasha Shmos, maybe somebody can remind me in case I don't bring it up on my own, but, you know, when God hardens uh, the Pharaoh of, of the enslavement period, uh, when, when, when he, Hashem hardens power's heart that he doesn't listen to Moshe's warnings and doesn't pay enough attention to the plagues, and not until only after the 10th plague does he, he agree to release us as per Hashem's demand, but how, how could Hashem harden his heart? How could you punish somebody if God prevents them from doing tshuva, from doing repentance. So the, um, the Malbim uh, uh, records, he's, he's not the inventor uh, of the, 
that theory and explanation. And he is, even though he, you know, he, he lived through the uh, late part of the 19th century. So he's later than most other commentaries, even though you know, he's uh, you know, more than 100 years away from us today. But that's uh, not so much in the course of Jewish history. But the Mabum does a good job in recording it. And, and, he, and he says is that sometimes the punishment of a wicked person is to be denied the opportunity or at least the opportunity to be very hard to exercise to actually repent and change one's ways. And if a person does not change his ways then he's going to uh, have a very big bill that he's going to owe Hashem. And that, that big bill is that he's going to perish, he's going to lose the Olam Haba, which means, at least according to commentaries on the Rambam on Maimonides, that his soul will be destroyed after death. It won't continue on. So there are some people who are so wicked that they don't deserve any piece of Olam Haba. Olam Haba has a lot of seating in it. It's the biggest stadium possible. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, your, your box seats and your special, uh, you know, clubhouse amenity in the spiritual realm seats. And, and, there's all, and you have the bleachers. So there are different levels in it. But, um, and, and, you know, and I would imagine that the souls were in the bleachers while they appreciate at least having gotten in, but you know maybe they also feel that they wish they were closer. We we you know descendants or disciples beneficiaries of other people's good actions. When we perform mitzvahs in in the merit or because of others, so you know the belief is that that helps to elevate people and it allows them to. Uh, the, the, it's it's unlimited seating. But the sections are monitored, but we can help the fashas, we can help the shamas, souls, uh, actually have what we call an aliyah to, to get to a better place in Olam Haba. But there are people who, who will not be granted Olam Haba. And, uh, and, and according to commentaries on the Rambam, it's not that they're in a eternal hell, Gehenim, that that Gehenim is a, is a, a, a purification process, but if you have too much to, to purify, it's like if you take a, a, a paper that you wrote on with pencil and you try to erase it and you keep on erasing, 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 that you keep on rubbing on the paper, in the end you rub away the paper together with the pencil marks. So that's sort of the if, the, if the soul needs that much correction, then the soul's going to be destroyed in that process. That's why our custom is only to recite Kaddish for 11 months, not 12 months, because 12 months would indicate the person, a wicked person, but still may, maybe may, might have made it into Gan Eden, but a lot, a lot of sins on their record uh, need, needed the full 12 month period. Uh, so you could still squeak in there, but if, it, but if at the end of the 12 months, there's still more, you know, more stuff that's trying to be purified and erased that the whole soul gets uh, erased and, and doesn't have a place in, in, in Olam Haba. And so the Mabim reminds us that there are people who unfortunately that their consequence for the way they live their life is that God makes their life good for them. They're not, they're not missing anything. If they realize they were missing something, they would do tshuva, they do mitzvahs, and, and then they'd get into Olam Haba, but they were so wicked up until now God lo loves people to do tshuva and repentance. And it's also an unnatural thing. How, how could, it, why should it even be possible that I can change something I did wrong three months ago or yesterday, that if I, with the right attitudes and take the right steps that I can rewrite history? I mean, I, you have to be a revisionist or you have to have a time machine to do that. But we don't have really either of those. So it's really an unnatural avenue we have to, to make some type of correction to our improper actions, you know, a hundred percent channel between us and Hashem. Um, more complicated if if we've injured another person in, in the process, so we have to get them to forgive us you know, as 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 well. But uh, but there are some people whose ultimate consequence is not to be granted entry into Olam Haba, and the Mappam says that's what we get 
uh, that's what Hashem gives by giving them their reward up front, meaning in their lifetime. And maybe even, this is not exactly what the Malpum says, but I'm going to add it, maybe even earlier in life. So they have it for a longer time because it, as such, they have no interest in changing their ways. So sometimes what appears to be the great success is a, is a cover up for something that eventually the soul will not be uh, will, not, will not be happy to uh, to face there's one other thing Rabbi, th Rabbi uh, yeah. I have a question I, don't, I think that bad people should be punished in this world I don't think that telling people that they're going to find righteousness in the next world I don't think that answers the issue of evil uh, it would it would be well the, the last few words that you add Rebecca you know, introduces another level you know into the world mm -hmm. um, I mean you could have people who are evil to Hashem and not evil to other people in this world mm -hmm. so that might be a little bit easier to digest but but the truth is, is that we have limited capacity we are finite beings and we're talking about concepts that are infinite. We're talking about God who is infinite and beyond mm -hmm. our, you know, our full comprehension. And we're talking about a, a world to come that is infinite. So these are not things that we can really digest so easily rationally, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, to, but, we, but we should try to at least be able to uh, you know, wrap some thought around the fact that ultimately, even though we don't, we don't tell people to be in any rush to get to the next dimension. You know, we're, we're supposed to live life here in this world. Torah is really only in this world. That mitzvah performance is in this world. So we want to be in this world and we should be doing as much as we can to perfect ourselves and to help perfect the world. But ultimately, um, Hashem reserves the major positive consequences for the people who are good, who are righteous in the world to come. I think we're going to stop here and I will take, a, if there are any other questions or, or comments, I'll take them and the lean maybe we'll just pick up with a one or two very quick points next, uh, next week. Okay, if you, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Going once. Oh, I see Sid Paris is on. I was just thinking of Sid this morning because I, I know from what he told me that uh, his schedule was to have brought him into uh, Boca and into Century Village. You're back here, Sid? Well, the snow this morning and uh, last night, if I can get out Sunday, will be great. Ah, how do you like that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it wasn't so bad. It was the wind. You missed, you missed your open, uh, okay. you missed your opportunity to leave. <laughs> <laughs> waited too long okay well we'll look forward i don't know about that yeah. whatever it is mr shem 